Right. Okay. Let's begin. So today we're talking about Alexander Alakine. And if you want to get a Russian really riled up, you say Alakine like I just did. And then a guy like Kostya Kavutsky will get on you and he'll say, no, it's Alyoshin or something like that. But then even, even when you do it, they're still going to tell you you do it wrong. Alyoshin. So there's no, yeah, there's no way to do ever do it right. So that's why we're just settling on Alakine. Um, so I'm going to blabber a little bit, but first what I'd like to do is just introduce this position so I can talk a little bit about Alakine and you guys can think about what's going on here. So this is in fact white to move. And the question that I will ask is who is better and why? And I am going to, I'm going to blabber just a little bit. So if you would like me to call on you, if you have strong feelings about who's better and why, um, then I'll, you know, put an exclam into the chat box and I'll call on you in a little bit. So you have a little bit of time to think about it too. Again, it's white to move. Okay, so we're talking about alakine. And um, one funny thing that I really didn't even appreciate uh, until kind of recently, is that the guy was only a couple years younger than Capablanca, even though in my mind, Capablanca is so much older. And the reason for that is Alakine's career like starts later. And it's because of the First World War. The dude just has a really rough time of it, man. A really rough time. So I'm gonna say a couple books that are really cool that uh, I know you guys don't read books these days, but I'm just gonna throw it out there in case you're interested. One of the greatest chess books of all time is called New York 1924. It's a tournament book that Alakine wrote. He wrote his best games, also considered a classic book. Um, and just for stories about Alakine, uh, Kasparov's has this huge section on him in My Great Predecessors that's pretty well written, especially in regards to just like understanding what was going on in the guy's life and his chess career. Um, another book that I'm going to recommend is this book here, Endgame Strategy. And um, a couple great Alakine examples are from this book, including this game here. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take today, and you know, there's so much you could talk about with Alakine. Um, and I'm just going to put it in my own words as a summary of what I think, what, what I think Alakine does is Alakheim is the first to appreciate uh, initiative and compensation in what I'm gonna call a modern way. And what I mean by that is like before Steinitz where things got really dull for a while, the game was very sacrificial and gung-ho, but not with like a foundation. And that's what Alakheim is, I think, gonna bring to the table. And if I, I don't know if they're going to let me give this lecture a title, but to me, it would be playing the end game like a boss. <laughs> playing the end game like a boss. Alakine, man. Oh, dude. Some of these end games I'm going to show you guys today. Absolutely amazing. And um, it, it is, I think, reflective of a new way of thinking about the game. Okay. So uh, why don't I call on somebody? I'll say a, more, a little bit more about Alakine in a second here. And Austin's going to say a word or two about this position. Austin, what do you got for us? Uh, I think white is better because uh, obviously your rook's on the d-file. Mm -hmm. And uh, black's king is kind of weak because uh, the g-pawn is missing. So uh -huh. the d7 square particularly and the h6 square are really weak. Okay. And also the bishop on e7 doesn't really have a good square besides c5. Okay, good. And just to um, just to ask, do you have an intuition about what white should do on the very first move? Well, I was thinking of bishop e3, just the thought bishop c5. Okay. Okay. So, uh, good. And uh, I'm going to call in one more person here. So this is Aradia. I'm pronouncing it wrong, I'm sure. So, uh, yeah. So like, my I thought like um, like 
why it's probably slightly better here since he has the open D file mm-hmm. and the healthy pawn structure. And also, um, I think the best move like here would probably be like um, bishop h6. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And also, I was looking at rook d7, but bishop d6 seemed really annoying. Okay, good. By the way, how do how do I pronounce your name correctly? I think I lost him. That's okay. We'll, we'll figure it out another time. By the way, while we're thinking about this, Adi, we're going to call him Adi. That's what he says in the chat. I, I'm happy to call on more people. Um, one thing that I want to stress about this kind of position is, you know, I think in the foreseeable future, we are going to actually be playing tournaments again, and Greg is going to get his U.S. chess school running again. And to me, this would be a great position to have people play out against each other and then see afterwards, you know, how the actual game went. And of course, you could do a cool thing where if you chose white, you would be the person playing white and the people who chose black could be black. Okay. So, all right. Let me show you this. I did a little trick on you a little bit. There's a small trick I did. Maybe this is psychological, maybe. I Alakine is in fact black in this position. And I think maybe by putting black, white on the bottom, it might have suggested that it was Alakine who was white. And, and then so you might have been a little tricked. Now I'm going to open this board a little bit. And it's just so you can see the names. And this guy, Sinosko Borowski, was an old timer that I think wrote a book that I read when I was a kid, but I can't really remember it too well. Um, the position is very interesting. And I think that white has to recognize the danger immediately, immediately, or he's going to be worse. Um, and the general idea, I'm going to show like this. I'm going to show what me just before the broadcast, me and Greg were kind of just kibitzing. And I'll just show you the variation that Greg played. So my bishop e3, rook a d8. I think Greg played f3, f5, king f1, king f7, king e2, king e6. And at this point, it's just fascinating because at this point, black is a, a definitely the one pressing. I'm not going to claim he's winning or anything like that, but he's pressing. And you can see it in a variation like this. We keep a rook on and our king is better than the white king. It's a very interesting situation. And of course, I think at the beginning, you know, most people's intuition would be like, well, if anyone's better, let's go back to the beginning a second here. If anyone's better, it's going to be white because of the split pawns, you know? So that's an interesting prejudice kind of in itself. Um, but, and also, you know, it's funny, it's like in the end game, you'd kind of be, at least I have a mild prejudice toward the pawns on the side of the board, because, you know, maybe you can somehow get a uh, outside pass pawn. But the point is, and we're going to see this in the game, is that the centralization of the king is where uh, things get really interesting and spicy. Okay, so um, let's, I'll tell you what, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show the game and then I think we'll go back. I'm just gonna, let's just do this. I'm just gonna walk through the game real slow like, and then we'll start at the beginning uh, at the end of it all and try to figure out if and when black went or white went wrong. Okay, so black played Bishop H6, definitely also the intuition of a lot of people here in the class. F5. Snip, snip, and now G3. One funny thing, actually, I just, I don't wanna to talk too much as I walk through this, but when I was studying the game, what I thought was interesting about the move G3 was it to me was an example of what people sometimes call the sunken cost fallacy. That is, you make an investment 
And then you're unwilling to say to yourself, oh, that was not a good investment. And the investment here, what we're talking about is Bishop H6, <clears throat> where now Black is worried rightfully about F4 and this kind of business, trapping the bishop. So then he, in order to, let's say, rationalize, keep his bishop on h6, which honestly we can see now has absolutely no purpose, right? There's, it's not doing anything there. Uh, to keep it there for a little bit longer, white plays g3. Okay. And so we get a position not too different from the variation that uh, Greg had with me in our just little beginning uh, of, you know, we were just messing around a little bit. Um, F3, and you know, I think a, a really interesting question to ask yourself here is, do, how bad is it? You know, is this a bad situation for white? I think a lot of people would reach this position, just be like, dude, I, I have to be fine. <laughs> I have to be totally fine. And um, maybe, maybe, but black is definitely the one who's pressing. Okay, H4, snip, snip, rook H8. Again, the question I'm gonna ask you guys is, where did white go wrong? I'm just gonna show it to you and then we'll go back through it again. Stop the rook from entering. B5, A5, A4. Where did he go wrong? Boom, boom. C4. Now at this point, I guess we, it's obvious to everybody that it's gone wrong, but it's not maybe totally clear that it's over yet. And then he resigned. Okay, so let's go back to the start. Any ideas, maybe just off the bat, we can go through it again. Uh, any ideas where white went wrong? A lot of people are saying bishop h6 is wrong. Um, I, I think we got to agree. And and by the way, if your bishop h6 was your first instinct, don't feel bad. I mean, it's it's just like, oh, you attack the rook with tempo. It feels like, oh, that should be the move, you know? All right, Liam is saying rook d3. Let's say rook fd8. I guess I could do the other one too, right? Um, and uh, black is doing pretty good, right? Isn't black doing pretty good there? Yeah. Rook g3 and bishop h6. Okay, boom. Now, um, king f8 is a little spicy. So if I go uh, here, 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 uh, I guess the claim that I would want to make for black is that we have the d file and therefore we're the one that is better. But, <laughs> but there might be some, yeah, this is a spicy way to play, sure. Now, Frank is saying, actually, excuse me, remember if, if I, the rules are, I'm not, I'm not supposed to actually say anything unless you put the X clamp, but somebody is saying F4. And then the question to me would be, well, what are you going to do after E4? I think that's to me the interesting question. By the way, one thing I want to stress while we're just thinking about this position is I did not, that all the analysis I did on this game, I just did it, you know, myself with a real board. I did not look at it with a computer. So I just, my ideas are just totally human here. And here we have somebody suggesting F5. Good. I think that is the path. And um, 
I think this is roughly equal, though honestly, I think I'd rather be white at this point. Um, right, I'd rather be white. And I think one of the things I wanna stress about this is that it's right away, it's right away in this position where white has to say to himself, oh, we need to stop this thing with f5, king f7, king e6. Once that happens, uh, I don't think you're lost yet, but it, it's 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 gonna hurt. the hurt is gonna come for sure. The hurt's gonna come. Okay, so um, one thing I'll stress is I think White can still do the F four idea now, right? So F four, E four, F five. You can still do it now, but otherwise, I think you're gonna get stuck into. Even, even though, for example, Greg's bishop e3 is better than bishop h6, you're still going to get a very similar position to the one uh, that Alakine gets here, unless, unless white has something amazing, which I don't see. Um, for example, you could also maybe try king f1, to be fair to Greg, was his initial instinct. And maybe something like that is more clever. And I'm willing to believe that that's totally equal as well, though well, there's questions. There's questions here. Yeah, still a dynamic game. Okay, so let's get into this. And um, Alakine in his book writes uh, the following basically about this position, okay? I'm gonna just read it to you. And one of the um, things that I want you to get out of what he writes here is a kind of global sense of the board. And one of the cool things that, I don't think Alakine invented it, but he really pursued as a kind of macho way of playing the ending is um, to, use what we now call, we still call, the principle of two weaknesses. So the principle of two weaknesses is just to say that if you want to talk about your position as winning, then what you are going to need is to have two weaknesses. And when we say a weakness, we can talk about uh, a pawn, if you're up a pawn, that's just one weakness. It doesn't mean you're not winning yet. You have a clear advantage with being up a pawn, but you're not winning yet. Um, and there can be multiple kinds of different weaknesses, a weak king, a weak pawn, you know, all kinds of weaknesses that I'm sure you're familiar with. And the idea of the principle of two weaknesses comes about in games like this, where really we would like to have a weakness on both sides of the board and then try to alternate our attack from one to the other, and, and the image that I like a lot is that of a rubber band being stretched, right? By sending him once this way and sending him once this way. And then over time, as you've probably had your own experience with, the rubber band will get weak and then break, right? So um, what I'm gonna read to you, I, you know, he doesn't actually use the, the, the terminology principle of two weaknesses, but I think you'll hear it from the words. So <clears throat> Black's plan consists of the following parts. Exchange one pair of rooks, that happened. Transfer the king to e6, where it will prevent the invasion at d7 by the remaining white rook. Basically, you see this a lot in King's Indian positions too. You, just the rook is ineffective on the d-file. Now, then three, operating with the rook on the open g-file and advancing the h-pawn forced the opening of the h-file. We saw that too. After this, white's king and possibly his bishop will be tied to the defense of h1 and h2 against invasion by the rook. Right? Black, meanwhile, by advancing his A and B pawns, will sooner or later open one of the files on the queen side. That's point number five. Six, since at this point, his king will still be on the opposite wing, white will be unable to prevent the invasion 
of the first or second rank by the black rook. Now, it must be admitted that had White from the beginning realized that there is a real danger for, of him losing this end game, by careful defense, he might have been able to save it. But what happened was that Black played according to a definite plan, whereas White played only with the conviction that the game was bound to end in a draw. Okay. It goes on from there, but I'll stop there. And again, I'll sh let's look at this. Let's go through it one more time. I, at this point, too, let me, one, one, <laughs> one Russian phrase that I like is the idea that it's, it's hard to give good advice. And that's how I feel it in, in the following uh, positions. Like, it's Can hard I ask for me a question? to know. Yeah, go ahead, Greg. Why, 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 you, why not like king f2 instead of bishop f2? Um, Spend that on. Okay, let's look. I just want to go like king g2 after instead of bishop g1. Bishop g1 seems weird. Mm, I, I, I'm with you. Yeah. Um, so we could play rook h8 or just hg directly, I guess, right? <clears throat> We'll yeah, just, I was just gonna go. I was gonna go king g two or rook h eight. Let's play b five. Oh, you're gonna do stuff. I'm just following his plan, Greg. <laughs> I'm just following sure, his sure. plan. Well, but you know, like, it just feels better to me. I, I'm not saying it's like that great, but mm -hmm, like the bishop mm -hmm. f two and g one stuff just seemed like. It helped a little too much, but I don't, I don't know. Maybe I'm, I didn't see I had, it close I enough. Had a, I had a similar feeling, and I want to respond to a question uh, somebody's asking about H3. Oh, so Remember, you got to have- here too. Oh, never mind. Well, wow. Yeah. Um, let me let me just first do this mm -hmm. question. So sure, the question sure. is, should black play H3 to fix H2? And I want to admit that that was also one of the things when I looked at this game, I was like, yeah, maybe we should play H3. But one of the key things I think about the way he played it is actually we want to open the H file. We want to open the H file. Um, I think here, let's say in terms, and now Greg's asking about things like A4. And maybe I'll just say that um, I, 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 I'm not convinced here, by the way, that black's winning, just that white is under the gun. And I think that that move right there, B3, it looks really innocuous, but I think that's one of the, that's a problematic move because that will allow us to open up the position. Now, the sad thing is though, <clears throat> that otherwise, if you don't do it, you're gonna allow me to play A4 and then you gotta try to sit with those pawns on A3. And then of course, like if my king ever enters, then that's it, you know? And that's totally it. Yeah, but I, but yeah, I agree with you, Greg. The bishop g1 does look pretty funny. Okay, uh, let me show you a variation I thought was interesting. We can look at, by the way, if you want to look at any particular variation, we can. Um, I thought this was a great move, rook g8. And it took me a while. <laughs> it took me a while to be like, wait, why is that a good move? And the reason is that you want to prevent uh, G4. At some point, G4, and by the way, if you have a prejudice for white in this position, it would be like, oh, maybe he's going to get an outside pass pawn someday. So rook G8 and then B5. And one of the key features to me is like, well, isn't white gonna be able to use the H file someday? That's how it always happens to me in my games. I open up the H file and then eventually the other guy gets to use it. And I think that critical question is coming right here. B3. Can I ask, uh, sorry, sorry. About, yeah, go ahead. What go if ahead. they played like king, king E2 instead of B3? Okay. Like with the idea of rook h1 and if rook h8, but then maybe I have g4. Rook h8. Yeah, maybe g4. g4. You know? mm -hmm. This looks bad though. Uh, yeah, it's not pleasant. Right? Mm -hmm. 
I mean, we're going to see he essentially has that, that same idea, right? So watch this. One thing that I thought was amazing in the game was this moment right here. And I spend a lot of time kind of scratching my head about this position where I really despise White's next move here, Rook D2. Yeah, could he just like, oh, sorry, I don't want to <laughs> go on. No, go ahead. Your, your question is obvious. Well, you right? might, you might be about H1, to ask them, right? You might be about yeah. to ask them, but yeah. Um, so let me just share. Rook H1, answer. or what about even taking on A4 and Rook B1? That's, that's oh, no, then the king king's exactly. going to walk in. Exactly. So we, let's mention that first. So if this yeah. and Rook B1, I think that's truly the end. Mm -hmm. I think that's truly the end. Because once my king gets there, it's like, oh, man. <laughs> and there's zero counterplay for actually for white on the queen side. Okay. So uh, the, the real question is like rook h1. And I want to say on a practical level, you know, never go passive like that. Oh, my God. <laughs> that makes me scream. You know, mm -hmm. that's the kind of thing I would scream at. But, okay, let me just say that the first couple moves that he makes where he does not play f4, right? So where the guy plays bishop h6 and then allows me to set up this juggernaut here with king e6. We could say something like, okay, that was superficial play. And then I thought rook d2, now maybe he's in trouble already anyway, but rook d2 was the move I was like, no, you can't play just like that. Well, can <laughs> I ask, sorry to bother you. <laughs> That's fine, go ahead, go this ahead. This b3 move. I, yeah. did, I know you already mentioned it, but yeah. like, if white doesn't do that, like it. So let's try it out. What it seems like, like it do? just gives, it gives black all these ideas, right? To get another open file on the, on the A file. Let, like, I, I'm, what is, I'm with you. Let's try, let's, so why don't you play, play well, white? First of all, what is white even trying to accomplish with that move? I don't. I think he's trying to set up a barricade on the C4 square so that his rook doesn't always have to worry about this. Can he, yeah, he could do that after the king's in d5. Right? Okay, um, I don't know. Just make a... What move to make? What did you, th what did you think he should do instead of b3? I think his only chance is at some point he's going to have to just try to sit with a3. And then the challenge is going to be that th th then you're your rook can never move off the default once that happens. Then can I ask, why do we have to go a3 even? Because when I play a5, a4, you're going to have to worry about a3 and also c5, c4, a3. Could I wait? Could I go b3 after a3? Could I go? Well, it depends wait, if like, pawns on c4 or not. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, once you play c5, then I'll reconsider. <laughs> Well, okay. Well, but let's just just for everybody's uh, and, and including my own. Let's just play a little uh, a little. You know, try it out. So go ahead, Greg. Just look. You know, I have a feeling you just want to sit, but you know. Like, yeah, I just want to see like what will happen if we don't play like these pawn moves. They don't mm -hmm. feel helpful to me. Uh, I'm gonna just rook you two, I guess. Okay. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, Rook D1, that's fine. That's fine. I mean, I don't feel good about it, but like, I just kind of want to see how it goes. Okay. So Rook D2. Mm -hmm. right. Okay, I'll try this. this. Hmm. No, I'll just sit, keep sitting. Okay. Now a three. No, okay. Let me actually. I should think about it for a touch too. Yeah. So. Because um, the problem for me, of course, is when I play c four. Then. Um, I have I I've blocked my own king out, right. one thing's for sure if we're reduced to moving or work back and forth i mean maybe white has a better plan than this but you know it does i don't, prove that I black don't know has, yeah black has the practical chances right and that's sometimes all you can ask for in a position like the one we had earlier mm -hmm. 
Let me just see this again. So C5 makes sense to me, root P1. And now, right, so let, let me just say the, the problem that Black has is how do I open the position on the queen side? Okay, how about, all right, let me, let's, I'm not super sure, but I'll try that, A3. Let's do the normal, um, let's try B3. And then I'm not 100% on this either, but I'll try C4. Let's try, the, uh, there's two choices. I can go B4 or I can take and put B1, right? Yeah, I'm not sure either. Let's take it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like B4 too, they both, they all look. I don't know if everyone, I don't, I'm sorry, I'm like taking over the class. <laughs> no, it's my I haven't idea. been in one of these for a while, so it's exciting. And I love this end game, it's very interesting. Yes. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure about it myself. Um, yeah. Let me ask this. So before we look at it, the real kind of big question is, is does, does Black even have anything? Right, have Liam has his hand up. I'm curious what he's. All right, so I'm going to call Liam, but we have, we'll come back to these questions in just a touch here. So. All right, Liam, help us out here. And maybe we'll go back just to reorient ourselves. We'll go back to this move B5. Well, uh, can you go to the position after C4? Sure. Uh huh. Oh, this one or this one? Uh, no, yeah, this one. Uh, I was thinking that um, White actually in this position could take on C4 and after mm. B takes C4, rook B1. Um, I thought it made sense to go rook b8 to try to not give up the file, but then mm -hmm. uh, white can take, uh, and after bishop b8, bishop c5, black's mm -hmm. only move is bishop d6, and after it takes, takes, uh, this should be winning for white because he has the outside pass pawn. Oh, winning for white, interesting. I think so, because like, let's say g4 at some point and bring the mm -hmm. king to the center, black's king is going to be distracted on the king's side. Okay. It's totally possible. I don't know about winning, but it is totally possible that I, I'm too soon with my own C4 there. Um, okay, but good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So let's, I think it, by yeah, the I way. I think you were right. Your instinct was that B3 was a bad move, right? For Wyatt. Well, also, I, I have to say, this is this is a game that has been studied immensely. <laughs> okay. And, yeah. you know, in the notes, everybody's, there's kind of, there's definitely um, agreement that B3 is incorrect. Okay. Um, and so that's one of the reasons I was, I really was into you pushing me on the matter. Like, sure. what, what do we do, buddy? What are we going to do? And so let's try to be clear on Black's problems. I have a trouble moving the rook on G8 because once I do, I have to worry about G4. Um. What, what about a plan? No, I'm thinking like get the rook to c6, like a5, rook a8, rook a6. And then do something. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what exactly. Like, how about this? Like, let's say I do this and you're sitting. And before I even play um, anything fancy, let's say, I, let's say I do this a3 thing. I don't know. I'll do it. I'll do it. You want B3 or you want B4? B3. Um. <laughs> yeah, this is kind of fun. Okay. And then let's play C5. So uh, what if I, I keep I, doing keep doing nothing? Yeah, I'm not sure. I I'm not totally sure about this. So the idea is that when let, let me ask you this. So what if yeah. you did that? I like maneuvered the rook to c6. Okay, instead well, of c5. The, what to c6? Remember though, my now that's totally possible. But the second I oh, move the g4. from g8 to g4, I'm worried about g4. It doesn't necessarily mean it's always going to be a thing. And especially yeah. now, I think my my it my loses notion, a pawn now. 
my notion was that if the pawn is here, we have this weakness, we should start looking at things like e4 and bishop e5 at some point, you know, mm -hmm. and maybe we do c5, c4 first. Um, okay. Like, the, the, so, okay, the idea is obvious that this pawn's gonna be weak. How about this, Greg, c5, Rook D one. Let me try this one, and then I and then we should probably go back to the game. Sure, <laughs> I'll stop torturing you. It's okay. Um, no, no, I I'm enjoying it a lot. Do you uh, want to play G four? That would be the question for me. Otherwise, I'm going to play C four. No, you win a pawn. You take and go Rook G eight, right? I guess it's that simple. So yeah. I can't play G four. I just wait, and this time you force B four. Is that your? Well, right. I'm I could force... play Rook B1, actually. Oh, no. The, yeah, Rook B1 is interesting. <laughs> but I don't know. You could probably That's go C4 fun. anyway. I might play C4 anyway. And now, of course, you have to worry about this at some point. Yeah. Play D5. That's actually pretty. I don't think you can take on C4. I can take and go Bishop E1, maybe, right? It's kind of like, seems playable ish. Oh, Liam has it. Oh, are you mm -hmm. tricking me? You trick me? I might oh trick God. you. I, well, oh you might God. be able to just sit, actually. Maybe maybe I'm tricking myself. <laughs> maybe, maybe you just sure, sit and I'm sure. tricking myself. Um, yeah, I have to be a little careful. That's interesting. Uh, Liam has his hand up again. He's okay. figured out Let me call somewhere him. we messed up. <laughs> he, might, he probably does. Okay, Liam, what do you got? Uh, can you go to the position where you're going to play C4? as black. Okay, sure. So we were like right here. I, I was just wondering, why do you want to play c4? Because if you play c4 after b4, can't white just later maneuver the bishop to c1 via e3 and uh, a3 is weak? Oh, that's a good, good idea. Good, good question. And um, part of part of it is uh, that I have to do so I have to do something. And the idea, the hope would be Black's hope. Now, I'm not saying this is true, but Black's hope would be that if you went and did this, first of all, it would take you a lot of time. And even if I gave you all those moves and then played rook a8, you move the bishop and I take the pawn, I would have I would have achieved something meaningful. And the the idea, of course, is that this guy is weak. And if I win him, I'm willing to sacrifice a lot to win him at this point too, both time and energy and maybe material. At some point, I'm gonna be looking at that, right? That's the thing I'm gonna be looking at, right? Now, I think it could get a lot more involved too, because when we are looking at this position, by the way, uh, let's say, in fact, we are looking at, um, let's say a3, b3, and I've played c5. Maybe at this point, white should be saying to himself, hey, let's play, it's funny actually, king g2 with the notion that if rook c8, then I can think about g4. But notice mm -hmm. in this position, the rook is not ready to come to b2. So there's a lot of finesse in this position, maybe even with some zook swarms, because I'm, I can play c4 a lot easier if your rook is on d2 than I can when I'm on when you're on b1. Okay, good. All right, Greg, I got it. I got. I want to show at least one more example before we. Have yeah, I'm not going to talk anymore. But I think <laughs> the, the, the main thing. <laughs> I think it's hard for some people to understand why if black goes C4 and white goes B4, why isn't this just totally fine for white? Mm, okay. Um, I think that's what Liam is wondering. Yeah, let's ask I'm the question, still... right? Let's ask the question, right? So we're yeah. right here. And um... and you're trying to go E4, Bishop E5 stuff. Is that... Oh, you can go... I can go Bishop can... E7 and then Bishop you F6. Can go, you can well. go E4 now. I might be able to, yeah. No, it's it's pretty. It's and this is part of the problem when you put the king on g two. Yeah, you're exposing yourself. And if that fact, was your yeah, move, just, that was your move. <laughs> well, but I I wanted I'm kidding, I right? wanted you to, I wanted to do something for him. I wanted to sure. do something. But that's yeah, very but true. It's right? interesting. This e four bishop e five. But okay, I'm gonna stop. Talking. I'm gonna let you do your thing. Okay, no, that's fine. No, uh, I I really enjoyed it. It's too exciting, you know. Chess is so exciting. 
Well, and you know, let me just say this end game to me is a big revelation in terms of just like how fast White got himself into trouble. And then the question is totally legitimate. Like, uh, well, could White have, you know, done something? And my instinct, by the way, over here was that in the game it went A5, King G2, A4, and to my mind, Rook H1 was by all means the right move, just on principle, because I want the rook to be active, you know? And then I spent this whole like time looking at A, B, A, B, Rook H, Rook A8, and I couldn't make it work. But then I just realized much later, I was like, wait a second, black now with, with Rook H1, you just play King D5, and it's a very pleasant end. It is a simply very pleasant ending. And a big part of it is there's no counterplay. You know, every everything's nailed down for black. So for example, if rook h5, well, then we'll just play f4. And we're, we're still looking to do things like a, b, and rook over and rook in. And we just need one of these pawns to move. And our king is going to, you know, it's going to start making inroads. Okay, good. So again, I'll go through the ending real quick, and then I want to show another example. I was going to, I actually have loads of examples. I had no idea how long this was going to take, but that's okay. Um, check to the miserable king. So you win the, you win the pawn, but it's not necessarily over, you know. There's some nice variations here. And one of the things we'll stress just, I want to stress how energetic the play is here for Black. Like Black isn't simply just trying to win his pawn and coast at home. No, he's trying to mate. And I know Aliokin, Aliotian, or Alakine wasn't the first to invent mating in the ending, but I think he was definitely like one of the main dudes to push it. And yeah, we're playing against the king. We have been for quite some time. Okay. Um, I have loads of examples, but you know, just on this subject, I'm gonna actually go to my, uh, 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 uh. <laughs> I'm gonna go to my final example here. And uh, I actually didn't have it properly pulled up, but I can get it real easily. And talk about this one, just cause it's kind of, it's very similar. Oh, actually, let me show you, let me show you something fun about this last game before we go to the final example. Let me show you how the game went. Actually, let me move this if you guys, maybe you can see that. Um, this is an old timey variation. And in this position, one of the things that's fascinating is I think a lot of players, I'm gonna suggest almost all of them would have gone snip, snip, snap and the game is very equal. And GF6, it's going to, I think, technically also be equal, but it's gonna create the potential challenge that white has here in the ending. Where? F5 and the centralization of the king is gonna come. Um, Zoe, the, uh, or excuse me, I'm not, <laughs> I'm trying not to call on people unless they put an X gun. But the question is, why is, what's the reason why black is better in the starting position? And the answer is, I don't think objectively that black is better in the starting position, but white does have, uh, black has a plan and black has, white has to do something about it. And my recommendation was F4, F5 immediately, uh, like right here, boom, boom. Also, he could have played bishop h6 and then f4, but I think we had kind of had agreement that bishop h6 wasn't a great move either. But something like this to stop the plan, really, of centralizing the king is going to be, I think, what white needs. And, but if he doesn't understand it, then there's going to be some drama. Okay, so let's go to um, the next example. So black, Alakai was also black in this game. And 
let's just go through this interesting position. Let's start here. One thing you might notice is there's some similarities here with black having big fat pawns in the center. And another thing that's similar is that in this position, white also tried to, to trade tried to trade queens. Okay, so um, one thing about alakine that I think is very useful to kind of think about is that in the olden times and a little bit still today, there are people who have prejudices for or against the queen side majority and the king side majority. And it took me a long time as a player myself to really understand the, let's call it qualitative differences. The, the reasons for believing in the queen side majority, I think are mostly obvious because what you're saying is, you're saying, oh, I'm gonna go make a pass pawn and I'm gonna win with that pass pawn. The king side majority is a lot less obvious, but I think one of the things that we got a little taste of in the, in the first game, even though it wasn't technically a king side majority, um, is that when you've got the central control and you're able to bring your king to the center, you're gonna bully the white king. And at the very least, even if you don't mate the white king, you're gonna make the white king into an inferior piece. Okay, let's look at the game here for a second. Rook d8, g3. I think, I think this game, you can have full sympathy for white. Not, not to say that, you know, you think maybe that um, white's better, but just to say, hey, it's, white can't be worse. But actually things get pretty hectic right here. And um, let's take a moment, actually. This is black to move. What should he do? Yeah, so I'll ask that as a question if somebody wants to take a shot at it and maybe explain. Whites, I'll, I'll, I'll try to channel white for a second here. And I believe white could just say to himself, hey, yes, maybe my king's worse, but I'm gonna get this beautiful pass pawn very soon. All right, let me got uh, Adi, hope I'm getting that right. And he's gonna go here. All right, Adi, what do you got for us? <clears throat> yes, I was thinking to go um, bishop takes c4, and white's gonna go rook takes c4, and then um, rook d3. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking black would be um, like much better and probably even close to winning because like white's probably gonna go like a4, and okay. like black can go like king e5, and um, yeah, I think he just and white's king is really bad, so I think he has a great position. Okay. Now, I think you're totally right, especially about the white king being bad. Um, but let's just play a move or two out. Now, maybe b5 for white, but if we go here, 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 not so easy, right? Because king d5, I can play c6. Um, I have a question, although yeah. I bet it's the same one that Liam has. Is this hands up? Mm. What if c6 in the very original after rook d3? Fair enough. Fair enough, also c6, very good, yeah, that's right. We'll take and go rook a6. And so in all these variations, I guess what you can see is you can see, <laughs> White's, you can see White's dreams, right? White's dreams are very simple. I, he, he's got that extra pawn on the queen side and I'm sure you guys have all had some kind of similar thing where you've got a pawn on the queen side majority and you roll that thing and black has weaknesses over there on the queen side and they're hard to defend. Yeah. All right, let me go back to the original position. So given that, any other ideas for black? Any other ideas for black here? We've got somebody suggesting rook d2. That makes definitely makes sense. In a way, that's going to be a similar position to bishop takes rook takes rook d3. Uh -huh. <laughs> Zoe knows the, the move. 
because it's been it was seen in a book before and so that's great um by the way i'm very impressed when people can remember games uh greg actually recalled it at you know maybe not the precise moves or anything but had a vague recollection of this game which i even if you ask me in a month or two from now i'm not sure i'm gonna be able to totally remember it okay so uh let's look at what happened Bishop C8, let's try to just wrap our minds around it for a second. So the bishop can serve to blockade the C pawn. And then in the meantime, this is really important. We're gonna push in the center and with the F pawn. And the key thing to see about the F pawn that's not immediately evident is that black is gonna be, uh, the one with the initiative against the white king. And when we play f4 as well, we're also going to be liberating our bishop. Um, a interesting thing about chess that took me forever to understand is that when you conceive a position like this, I think it's useful to say that now black has three pieces playing and white really only has two. And that numerical advantage should probably eventually, you know, make itself felt. And I think that's one of the things we see in this game. So let's check it out. A4, G5, B5, both sides following the plan, F4. Yeah, it's definitely a little bit unpleasant. King f1, rook d2, king e1, rook b2. Now, I think already white has to worry about things like e3 takes and f3. And again, the bishop, the bishop's really useful. You know, he's sitting back there, but now all of a sudden you can see he's vicious because he might come to g4 in variations to hit this, and also this one to hit the queening square. You know, it's really, and it's really remarkable because when you go back just a couple moves, like here, it's not at all obvious, you know, that we are going to be marching those pawns in any meaningful way. And maybe another thing I can just say on a more general level that's kind of interesting is that <clears throat> even though we're in an end game, you can think of it as an, 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 an excuse me, in an analogous, analogous kind of way to a middle game where you have an attack on both wings, right? So in this case, white is attacking on the queen side, black is attacking in the middle and the king side. And like those positions that we've all seen that are crazy in the middle game, what, what, what's true of those and what's true of this one is if you have the initiative, then that's a very valuable thing <laughs> to have the initiative in a position where there's attacks on both ends. Initiative is always important, but there's some positions really, I think it's more important, right? Attack on both uh, different wings, that's a great example. Bishops of opposite color is another good example. Um, okay, so let's go bishop e2, king e5, c6. Everything about white's play has been very predictable so far. Pawn takes, and here's the bummer. If you play pawn takes, how do you intend to advance the thing? Very difficult. That's a sad move. And I think it's already gone here. Very gone. And then white resigns. So yeah, really stunning example. And to my mind, very similar to the first one, right? Where you're using the centralized king to bully both sides of the board, right? Not just the one side of the board. Okay, I have two more examples. We're probably just gonna be able to taste one of them, but uh, let's do this one here. A very interesting position. Um, all right, in this position, it's white to move. Obviously white has the advantage. 
Um, but I'll tell you what, if anyone wants to, um, to, to say what they think both white, white should do and what they think the dynamic of the position is, I think that would be interesting. Um, all right, we have a request to have, to send the PGN of the last game. I think that's something I can do. Let's see. Uh, yeah. So, right, I actually just did it in the chat. I hope that's kosher. One comment is transfer king to king side, then push B2 and win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, let's bring Adi in here. Adi, what do you got for us? Yeah, so uh, I don't have any idea, but I was thinking that if we um, trade the queens off, I think white um, almost guaranteed to win because, like, he can go on, like, the king side and the knight will be t tied down to the uh, – to, like, the guard of the b pawn. And, yeah, mm -hmm. I think that just – if that happens, then it's really good, but it's pretty hard to make that happen. Okay, good. We have a comment here without an exclamation that says, "White well, could also push the H pawn to H six to make two weaknesses." Definitely interesting, yeah. And the the main reason I showed this example. By the way, I'm, well, I'm going to give a little speech, and then if you have an idea of what White should do as a first move, it's kind of an interesting challenge. So the speech I'm going to give about this position is that I think most players would see this thing, actually I know this to be true, also about myself. They would see this position and say, well, <laughs> the only game in town is me pushing that B pawn, right? The only game in town is me pushing that B pawn. Well, it's actually kind of hard to push the B pawn and just win by brute force. And one way to understand that is two twofold. Uh, the knight controls can control the dark squares, and he's got black has the uh, the, the, the I was going to call it the overhand. <laughs> That's not a, really a word. He's got the upper hand on the dark squares. I like overhand. He's got the overhand on the dark squares, and plus, once you start pushing the pawn, you are opening your king up to a bunch of nasty checks. We got queen b4 as a uh, recommendation, definitely interesting. And while, while actually we're waiting for somebody to maybe make a claim, I'll say one of the things that's interesting is there's a common prejudice out there that the queen and knight is a great combination in itself, suggesting that it's better than the queen and the bishop. And I think where that comes from is a bunch of people have been mated uh, and they have that very visceral memory of where, when a queen and knight started dancing all over your king and it was very painful. That's happened to everybody. Um, but I think it's wrong for a couple reasons. The, the positions where the queen and the knight flourish are positions where the knight would flourish anyway, where he, so you, there's some local weaknesses and the knight can dance around. That's where the knight is beautiful. But of course, in a position like this, where we've got pawns that are stretching the board and the knight needs to you know, talk to both sides of the board, it's definitely gonna be the bishop who's better, wh whether we have the queens on or not. And I think what the queens mostly do is they make the game much more complicated. You know, And if I wanted to trade the queens to my eyes, it would be like, it would just be so much more kind on my soul to trade the queens because I'm just, you know, it's so hard to keep the black queen out from messing with us. Anyways, I'll just mention in, 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 to finish this thought about the queen and bishop is a statistical study was done and asked it in a simple question, well, who won more of the queen and bishop versus queen and knight? And it was in fact the queen and the bishop. And, you know, it was kind of... <clears throat> Kind of a funny thing because the, the idea of the queen and knight is still out there to a large extent. You'll hear very strong players even saying it still. And let's just say the obvious. The bishop, bro, what a beast in the endgame. 
what would it be? So that's four, five, six, seven, eight, not, excuse me, that's not nine, 10, 11. And uh, it can go up to 13. And the knight, of course, eight at the maximum. And right here, he's got four. In any case, let me show this great uh, move. Queen d4, beautiful centralizing move, taking away loads of squares. And it's anti-intuitive. It's not the first move people think of because most people, including myself, would be like, hey, I need to hold on to that e1 square. But of course, the beauty here is that queen's covering everything. Even like if we go down here, it's even covering this entrance square and this one. And it's pointing to a very simple truth, which is that late in the game, the queen really wants to centralize. Okay, we don't have that much time left, but I'll just kind of breeze through this beautiful game here. What are we doing? We're creating a second weakness. H7 is that weakness at the moment. Mm, beautiful. Very hard. Very th great thing to remember, by the way, just the, the fact of you know these two pieces dominating everything in the middle of the board. We got our queen trade. Thank you very much. Makes it look easy now. end of the game. Okay, you guys, I enjoyed it very much. And uh, hopefully Greg will let me on at some future point and I can debate him further on some of these endings. All right, everybody, thank you so much. And I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, that was fun. Bye.